Hey there, I'm Greg Nystrom. Today I want to talk to you about uh, signs built into the geography and topography of the Holy Land. God puts signs in all manner of things, um, astronomical signs, for example, the star of Bethlehem. The Bible says when Jesus returns, there'll be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Um, events, historical events, especially the ones um, recounted in the Bible, have uh, prophetic significance and are a sign of something. Even Jesus said, for example, that the bronze snake put on the pole where the people, the Israelites, would have to look up to it to, to be healed of poisonous snake bites was a sign of him dying on the cross and, you know, healing people from the poison of sin. Okay, and there was another sign that Jesus said, pointed to him, that he specifically said, and we're going to talk about that one a little later in the teaching. Um, other events in the Bible, the story of Joseph in the Bible, there are many, many prophetic parallels in the story of Joseph with Jesus. So God puts signs in, in all manner of things, names and numbers, even the name of Jesus in Hebrew, the shortened version is Yeshua, that means God saves. So that name was not given arbitrarily, obviously. Well, it's also geography and topography. So this is a, a simple uh, kind of rendition, a drawing of, of the Holy Land in the time of Jesus. You see the Dead Sea down here um, in the southern part, the Jordan River flowing into it. There's this, the Sea of Galilee, which obviously if you read the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you are very familiar with that. There was a little lake called Lake Hula that was north of that, which the, the northern course of the Jordan flowed from there to the Sea of Galilee. That lake doesn't exist anymore. They drained it, in, I think, around 1950, maybe, um, because of mosquitoes and malaria. So now it's just the Hula Valley in that general region. Then we have, of course, uh, the town of Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. We've got uh, Bethlehem, where he was born, and then Jerusalem, obviously, where he was uh, killed, crucified, and buried just outside of the city of Jerusalem. So I want to talk to you about some of the things that God has built in to the uh, geography here. So let's start with uh, the Sea of Galilee. So the Sea of Galilee was, uh, obviously, like I said, it was very important in the time of Jesus. Um, some of the towns, one, here's a town called Bethsaida up here. I didn't write the name, but that little dot right there on the other side of the Jordan, Bethsaida. That was the birthplace of Simon, um, Andrew, Simon Peter, Andrew, and Philip. But then Peter later moved to a town called Capernaum, and that was very uh, important in Jesus' ministry. He was actually headquartered there for a while. A number of events happened there. That other town up there is Corazon, which we'll talk about later on. And then over here is uh, Tiberias, and this is sometimes called the Sea of Tiberias. Um, there's other towns around that were around there, but I, those are the ones I put on there. In this side, kind of the southeast side of the lake, uh, the Sea of Galilee, and over in here was the Gad Gadarenes, um, the cities of the Decapolis, the ten cities, Decapolis meaning ten cities. And Jesus um, was over here as well. In fact, this is the place, the other that side of the Sea of Galilee is where he um, healed the demon-possessed man that had a legion of demons in him. Um, Bethsaida is where Jesus healed a blind man. It's near where he fed the 5,000. Capernaum, he did healings and teachings in Capernaum. Uh, the centurion whose servant was healed, that happened in Capernaum. Um, and as you know, of course, Jesus walked on the Sea of Galilee, he walked on water on this sea. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount was on the, the shore, the banks, uh, the bank of the Sea of Galilee. So, his ministry was much centered around the sea and this whole area uh, called Galilee. Um, that is prophesied in the Bible. And there's an interesting um, exchange that happened in the Bible between Nicodemus, who was, uh, as you know, one of, one of the Pharisees, but who was sympathetic to Jesus and his cause, and another person. All right, so this is Nicodemus speaking to the officers of the chief priests and Pharisees. John 7.50 Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night, being one of them, doth our law judge any man before it hear him, and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. 
So this man is saying to, to Nicodemus, and he is acting like he's an expert on the scriptures. And he says, there, read the scriptures, and you will see that no prophet comes out of Galilee. Well, guess what? He's wrong. <laughs> he's wrong. Now, first of all, he's talking probably about, of course, Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem. And if they had done their research, they might have found that Jesus was actually born in Bethlehem. And guess what? The scriptures say the Messiah would be born, would come out of Bethlehem. But that's not all. This man was wrong. The scriptures do testify that a prophet would come out of Galilee and be, have his ministry centered in the region of Galilee and not just a prophet. So he was wrong. Let's, let's turn to Isaiah 9.1. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun in the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Stop there. Now let's go to Matthew 4.12. Now when Jesus heard that John had been taken into custody, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the Isaiah the prophet. And it goes on to read the passage that I just quoted for you, so I won't read that again. Okay? So, but the point is, the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, two of the tribes of the Israelites, was in the region of the Sea of Galilee, right? In the region of Galilee. And the light that that mentioned in that scripture from Isaiah is Jesus. Jesus is the light of the world. That He is the light dawning, right? So the scriptures do testify that the ministry of Jesus would be centered around Galilee. And that man was wrong. The so-called scripture expert was wrong. Okay? So we've got that. So now that we've got that established, let's try to get into some of the actual uh, signs built into the land here. So let's start with the Sea of Galilee. And um, let me get some notes here, so bear with me. Uh, so let's go to the Sea of Galilee. So in the King James or the New King James, it will say Lake Gennesaret. That is the Greek version of the Hebrew word. So if you were to look it up in Strong's, um, it would be 1082 in the Greek side of Strong's Concordance, if you're familiar with that. And then... Um, it would refer you, however, to the Hebrew 33672, and that's going to be a word that's kind of like kinneret, sometimes spelled with a K, sometimes spelled with a CH. And so it's uh, Lake Kinneret or Lake Kinneret. Um, this is so Lake Gennesaret. It's, it's all the same thing. And what does, uh, according to Strong's, what does that word mean in Hebrew? It means um, harp harps, or harp-shaped. Okay? Harp, harps, or harp-shaped. I'm just going to put harp. How's that? I'll just put harp. Okay? And so this lake um, kind of resembled a stringed instrument that they had back in that time. It wouldn't be the modern harp with the big giant harp with somebody sitting and playing, but something smaller, and it had then would be kind of wider at the top and, and kind of come more uh, to a, more of a point, a little narrow in, at the bottom of it. And so the lake was named then after that shape, a harp-shaped lake. So that's very interesting. Why is that interesting? Because what harps are associated with in the Bible. So let's go again. So this is John having been taken up in heaven earlier, and this is what he's witnessing, one of the things he's witnessing. Revelation 5.8 When he had taken the book of the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Let's go to Revelation 14.1 Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of thunder, in the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Let's go to, now let's go to Revelation 15, 2. 
And I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of God. And they sang the song of Moses, the bondservant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, and I won't go into the song. So uh, the sea of glass that he mentioned, John mentions in that last part, he also mentioned earlier when he was taken up to heaven and saw the 24 elders and there was a sea of glass there. So in each of those three passages, we see that harps are associated with heaven. People are in heaven playing these harps. Harps and heaven go together. Okay? And this lake is called the harp or a harp because of its shape. Okay, so that brings us to our next one, all right? So let's look at the Dead Sea now, okay? Let's look at the Dead Sea, and let's give you some facts about the Dead Sea. It's called the Dead Sea because the saline content is so high that fish and plants cannot survive there. There's no fish. There was no fishing. <laughs> and still is no fishing in the Dead Sea, okay? Also, it is the lowest land-based place on Earth. It is almost, uh, if you were standing on the shore of the Dead Sea, you would be about 1,400 feet below sea level. That's how low it is. It's also the lowest body of water on planet Earth, okay? So, and... All right, so let's start writing this down. Let's, let's go Dead Sea. I'll go over here. So, first of all, um, right, no life. Let's just put no life. That's why it's called the Dead Sea. It's called the Sea of Salt in the Old Testament, right? So I'll put Dead Sea right here. No life. It's uh, the lowest right, place on Earth. Okay. All right, number three, it is also in a southern uh, direction from the Sea of Galilee. And we often think of, of on maps, north is up and south is down, right? Right, so let's put down on a map. So not only is it down as far as altitude goes, as height to where it is in position, it's the lowest land-based place on Earth. It's also down on the map. Now you can see where I'm going with this, right? So these three things can represent what, right? I'm talking about when you think of heaven, you think of up. When you think of the grave or the tomb or even hell, you think of down, right? So we're talking about, okay, let's put it over here. Let's put the grave or tomb or hell, right? No life, death, death. It's down low in the earth, right? And it's down on the map. And that's three ways in which it could represent the grave, tomb, Hell or death. Let's put death too. I could have should have put death first, but it's all it's all the same kind of a thing, right? And you can see if if harp is associated with heaven, then the Dead Sea is associated with hell and death and the grave and the tomb. You see how that works? Now we're going to go even deeper into this, and uh, this is going to be uh, a pretty cool thing. Um, but before I get into that, I want to show you the shape of the the present modern right now how the Dead Sea has looks now because it's changed it has receded and in this receding it's actually kind of broken into two sections it always had a, a northern basin and a southern basin and the northern basin was always the deeper one going as, as much as a thousand feet deep I think in some places and the southern the southern region was always uh, more shallow but this is actually receded enough. There's like a strip of land between these two basins now, and it's actually kind of been divided in two. So if you look at a more, you know, I'm not the best uh, at drawing in the world, so you have there's some error in the, my own personal drawing. 
But if you look at a map, you can see it's more of this shape, and this is what it looked like before. And every, if you look at every map of the Holy Land, it's going to look uh, like more like that, okay? And it's so, very interesting because the Bible actually predicts that the Dead Sea will go into two parts, be divided into two parts. The Bible predicts that. It's already coming true. This is Bible prophecy happening in front of our eyes right here when this, this is happening. So I'm going to read that scripture in a few minutes and, and show you where that scripture is in the Bible, okay? But I want to do something else first, so I'm going to do a quick edit here. Okay, we're back. So I've drawn uh, a giant fish or a whale here. And every time I look at a map of the Holy Land, for years and years and years, the first thing that jumps out at me is the Dead Sea, and it jumps out at me like that looks just like a whale or a, a fish, a representation. Of That's it. significant. Why is that significant? Well, because of Matthew 12, 39. Let's go to Matthew, actually. Let's start at Matthew 12, 38. And some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So here's Jesus saying that the experience Jonah had of being swallowed by the great fish was prophetic of him being killed and put in a tomb for three days and then raising from the dead because Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, but then he came out alive. That was always to be a prophetic sign of Jesus' death and resurrection. And isn't it interesting that the Dead Sea can look like a whale or a fish? I think that's very interesting, and I don't think it's an accident. But you can decide for yourself if you think it's just a coincidence that if it really looks like a whale to you or not, a fish to you or not. But I think it does. I think it looks like a, a whale. And uh, we shall see. But anyway, that is also very interesting, of course, um, with where Jesus was killed. Where was Jesus killed? Jerusalem. Just outside the city of that time. Just right outside of it. Right? Jerusalem. He's killed and buried just outside of Jerusalem. If you draw a straight line from Jerusalem, you pretty much come to the very northern end of the Dead Sea. So you can pretty much draw a straight line, and this is, would be what? Where the mouth of the fish would be. is exactly even with the city of Jerusalem. Jesus, right? Jonah and the great fish being swallowed. Jesus dying, the sign of Jonah, and it's directly across, geographically speaking. I think that's pretty cool. All right, so I'm just going to put uh, four great fish for the Dead Sea. Again, the tomb, the grave, death. Jesus overcame death, right? Oh, death, where's your sting, the Bible says. The Bible says that Jesus holds the keys of death and Hades, meaning hell, in his hands. All right? He's overcome death and hell. He's overcome physical death. He's also overcoming punishment hell by forgiveness of sins. All right? So let's talk about more about salt and the Dead Sea. It's the salt sea. It's the salt content that makes it um, life, right? Unable to, to exist, fish and plants to, to exist there. And this time we're going to Mark 9, 48. All right, actually going to go to verse 47. And right before this, Jesus is saying, he said, uh, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to have one hand than to go to hell said the same thing about the foot, and now he says this in verse 47. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. So let's talk about the salt. Let's dissect what Jesus is saying was about salt. So, salt is a season, it gives flavor, but it's also a preservative. It preserved meat and preserved, right, to preserve things. So salt can have a good connotation and a bad connotation. So Jesus said, in another place, where he says, you're the salt of the earth, right? Flavor and preserving. Preserving 
right? The teachings of his teachings of Jesus. And then his and teaching. teachings of eternal life, which you are, your, your life is preserved forever if you have eternal life. But then also salt, meaning death here, the salt sea, the dead sea. And you can be preserved in a fire that is not quenched. See, Jesus quoted the prophet Isaiah, where their worm doesn't die, and the fire is not quenched. Worm meaning suffering, like a cankerous worm. They're suffering. He's talking about hell. In hell, their suffering doesn't end, and that fire just keeps burning and burning. Just like the fire in the burning bush, it doesn't consume the bush, right? When God talked to Moses, well, the fire just keeps burning and they're suffering, but the fire is never quenched. The person is never burned up. They are preserved forever. Burning in fire, that's a horrible, horrible thing. And this is what Jesus is warning about, how terrible it is. That's why he says, you know, whatever, whatever, it's better to, uh, you know, go through life with one hand, one foot, and one eye than to go to hell. That's how terrible hell is. So salt can also represent then, right, that preservation in fire, a negative connotation. And of course, Sodom and Gomorrah was located somewhere uh, relative area of the Red, excuse me, relative area of the Dead Sea. And that is, of course, always been a sign of judgment, right? Sign of judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, in fact, that leads us to our next, uh, next Bible quote here, because... Oh, and by the way, before I get to that, what was Lot's wife turned into when she turned back? A pillar of salt. Pillar of salt. Okay. So now let's talk about, though, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. We're going to bring up, all right, we're going to go to another Bible passage. Remember I talked about Bethsaida, Capernaum, Chorazan is another little town that was up there. Let's read what Jesus said at one point to them. We're going to go to Luke 10, 13 now. This is Jesus speaking. Woe to you, Chorazan! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. So Jesus is talking about these three cities here, Bethsaida, Capernaum, Chorazan, where he did a lot of miracles and healing, and yet, a lot of the people were not responsive. So what did he say? Capernaum, you were exalted to heaven. Harp, right? Heaven. Harp, heaven. Harp-shaped heaven, right? Jesus' ministry, heaven on earth. He brought the kingdom of God to earth, and it was centered around, right? And it's in a northerly direction, an upward direction, right? And as compared to an altitude, it's higher than the Dead Sea, which is very low. Heaven. All these things point to this as a, right, of like heaven, or at least heaven come to earth in the form of Jesus. Capernaum, he says, you're exalted to heaven. You're up here. You're in heaven. But you're going to be brought down here into Hades. Ask you about the, I said the prophecy about how the Dead Sea would be split in two. So let's talk about that. We've got to go to several scriptures for that. Let's start with Zechariah 14.4. 4. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two, from east to west, making a very large valley. Half the mountain shall move toward the north, and half of it toward the south. Let's go to verse 8. And in that day it shall be that living water shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and half of them towards the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. Okay? So what this prophecy is saying is that when Jesus comes back, this is talking about the Messiah, this is prophetic, prophetic of the Messiah. He goes to the, the Mount of Olives, splits it in two. And what's going to happen is there's going to be water flowing from basically from Jerusalem into the Dead Sea, and it's going to bring it to life, living waters. And we're going to read another passage here in a second. And it's also going to flow towards the Mediterranean Sea, okay? All right, so now let's go to the book of Ezekiel 47.8. 47.8, Ezekiel is uh, having a vision of a river coming from the temple. Then he said to me, This water flows towards the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, it, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river, rivers go will live. 
There will be a very great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. It shall be that the fishermen will stand by it from Engedi to Englame. They will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds of fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. But its swamps and marshes will not be healed. They will be given over to salt. So what this is saying is, right, it's going to, the river is going to flow into the Dead Sea, making it come alive when Jesus comes back. And of course, that's appropriate because Jesus is all about going from death to life. You believe in Jesus, you overcome death, you overcome eternal punishment, you have eternal life, right? He brings the dead to life. To life. And he brings the Dead Sea to life when he comes back in this river with healing waters. Jesus heals. He heals us from sin, from death. Right? And that's what's going to happen when this river flows from under the temple mount. It's going to flow into the Dead Sea. That's a great and wonderful prophecy, and it's a true prophecy. All right. But it also says what? The marshlands and the swamps will be given over to salt. This, this, this southern area, right, is already uh, uh, kind of like that, right? So it, it predicts it's going to be in two sections. I think that's amazing, amazing prophecy that will come true. And oh, by the way, the, uh, in 2011, when they were building a, a train, I think something for a train in, near Jerusalem, near the convention center, they found a cave with the largest underwater uh, water supply, underwater river ever, ever to be found in Israel. That was in 2011. So the potential for finding underground, excuse me, the potential for finding underground water in and around Jerusalem, it's there. It's there. And so God, is, God has got this water just waiting, right? It's, it's been there. It's, and it's going to come out when Jesus comes back. The Mount of Olives splits apart. And this river is going to flow and it's going to heal the Dead Sea because Jesus is what? The way, the truth, and the life. He's about going from death to life through him. Let's talk about another interesting couple of things. And oh, by the way, very interesting Nazareth. Uh, if you draw a straight line from Nazareth, you come to the very southern tip of that. Um, they're almost on the exact same line. It's that very southern tip of the Sea of Galilee in Nazareth. Just like Jerusalem, you come to the northern tip of this. Okay, that's also very interesting. So, what happens? Jesus rises, right? Rises from the dead. And then at some point, he goes where? Back up to the harp, the heaven, the Sea of Galilee. Right? So, let's read that. So we have uh, earlier the disciples are, are, are fishing in the sea. They're not getting any uh, fish. Jesus tells them, and they didn't recognize him at first, but they recognize him right after. He says uh, in verse 6 here, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. That's verse 6. Now we'll go to verse 11. Simon Peter went up and dragged the, the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. All right, so 153 fish, okay? So a lot of, there's been a lot of speculation. What could that mean? Some people said there was 153 different varieties of fish. Some say it was for 153 nations that existed or would exist in the future. Um, but the idea then is, is, Jesus said, I will make you fishers of men. So the idea of the gospel being spread to the world, really, to the Gentiles, not just uh, the Jewish people, but to the to to the ends of the world, and then bringing in, and it's it's, and it can contain everybody. The net didn't break with all these 153 fish, and another thing it could point to is what is called the fullness of the Gentiles, and and the Apostle Paul talked about the fullness of the Gentiles. I think that's Romans 11:25, the full number of Gentiles coming into the kingdom. As you know, that the kingdom started with. The Jewish people, the apostles, the three thousand, the all the, the the foundation of the church was Jewish, but then, right, it would spread to the Gentiles would then come to be the big part of of the church. So 153, and that's very interesting. If you look, look in the Bible, I've only found one other place in the Bible where the number 153 is even written out besides this, and I want to share that with you. Two Chronicles 2:17. And Solomon numbered all the aliens who were in the land of Israel after the census in which David his father had numbered them. 
and there were found to be 153,600. And he made 70,000 of them bearers of burdens, 80,000 stone cutters in the mountain, and 3,600 overseers to make the people work. All right. So this is about the building of the temple, and there was 153,600 aliens or Gentiles, right? Non Israelites. And what were they doing? Solomon put them to work building the temple. Building the temple. And the Gentiles were a big, are a big part of the church. Started with the Jewish foundation, but the temple, but the Gentiles, excuse me, would be come into the church. And Paul talked about the fullness of the Gentiles, that one day the fullness. And maybe that net then is about fullness because then it ties into the 153,600 Gentiles helping to build the Temple of Solomon.